My name is Amanda Thomas, and I'd like to welcome you to A Scientist Walks Into a Bar. This podcast features recordings of talks given at Science on Tap, a series of science lectures held in Portland, Oregon, and Vancouver, Washington. In this episode, we'll hear a talk called The Neuroscience of Pain, The Good, The Very Bad, and The Ugly with Dr. Michael Morgan. Mike is a professor of psychology at Washington State University, Vancouver, and while he's not the kind of doctor who can help you manage your pain, he can tell you a lot about how it's processed in your brain and nervous system. He'll explain why experiencing pain is important for your health and also talk about how and why it can go wrong. Mike also discusses some benefits and dangers of the medications that are used to manage pain and a bit on the research for how to treat pain more effectively. Here we go. I would like to introduce our speaker again, Dr. Mike Morgan, a professor of psychology from WSU Vancouver. Come on up on stage, Mike. So I'm going to start out with a definition of pain, and this is the definition from the International Association for the Study of Pain. Yes, there's a real organization that is devoted to studying pain, um, and their definition has the key words in it. You know, it's an emotional experience with tissue damage, but it doesn't really capture the way we feel about pain. And so what I'm going to start with is a pain story, and, yeah, and if I fall off the stage, put me back on, give me some opiates, and I'm good to go. <laughs> Um, so anyhow, in, in terms of my own personal story, um, when I was a young man of about 40, uh, we went on a family vacation to Cabo San Lucas, Mexico. And um, if you've been down there, um, you know, most of the waves that are on the beach there are relatively mild. But if you listen, every so often you'll hear one that just crashes onto the wave. You can hear it from the hotels. Um, well, one morning I thought I'd go down and do some body surfing, and I caught these little waves, no big deal. And then I saw this big one rising. I thought, oh, that's the one I'm going to get. And I swam out, and I had timed it perfect, got on that thing, and it lifted me up. And at that point, all the water underneath just pulled away, and it literally put me head down from about 12 feet, um, a little bit like this guy. And I knew I was going to land on my head. At the last second, I just turned a little bit, landed on my shoulder, and um, dislocated my collarbone, broke a rib, and my first thought was, I need to get out of this water. And you know, when you crash like that in the ocean, you get tumbled. And um, you know, I wasn't concerned about pain at that point. What I was concerned about was living. And so I stumbled out of the water, fought the waves, sat down on the beach until I could catch my breath. And then the pain started kicking in, and I thought, I need to get back to the room. And I got about, you know, just about to the hotel, and passed out from the pain, um, wasn't out for long because you know, your head goes down, the blood goes back, you wake up. And, um, and then I made it up to the room and I spent the next five days just laying on a bed. And if you've ever broken a rib, you know that every breath hurts because your ribs expand. Um, so you know, that captures a little bit more of the essence of pain. Um, and the fact that this happened over 15 years ago, and I can remember the details of it, tells you something about the impact of pain. But the other reason I tell you that story is that every one of you has a pain story, or multiple pain stories, where you broke a limb, um, gave birth to a kid, um, and other people are sitting in this room, and just by moving or having someone touch your arm, you can have pain that is comparable to that kind of pain. So it's a much more emotional and um, meaningful stimulus uh, than this definition really conveys. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk about pain in six steps. First, we're going to talk a little bit about the anatomy um, so that you have some understanding of how, this, um, how pain gets processed. And then I'm going to talk about the good part. And people, when you talk about pain, typically don't think about it being good, but it's extremely important. In fact, I would say it's the most important sensory system that you have. Uh, then we'll talk about the bad part. This is the chronic pain piece. Uh, we'll get into the ugly piece, which is the opioid dependence part. Um, and then I'll try to leave you with a little bit of hope, because everything up to that point is pretty grim. Um, and then we can answer some questions. So the neuroanatomy of pain. Um, a key thing to remember with any sensory system is that everything is being coded by neurons. And so neurons come in many different shapes and sizes, but it's the activity of those neurons that are carrying messages from the skin into the spinal cord up to the brain. And so any activity in those neurons, no matter how it's caused, is going to evoke the sensation of pain. 
And when we look at the skin, there's really three different sensory um, modalities that are being coded by the skin. There's the sense of touch, you know, which is called mechanoreception, so rece reception to mechanical stimuli. There's thermoreception, that's the sensation of hot and cold that your skin can detect. And then there's nociception, noso being noxious, so it's the sensation of noxious stimuli, so such as lying on a bed of nails um, would be that sensation. And when we go down and look at the skin and see how these things are coded, what you'll notice is that there are different types of neurons for these different sensations. So in terms of the thermoreception, you have different types of nerve fibers in the skin to detect that. For the mechanoreception, you have other specialized neurons to detect that. And then for the pain sensation, what you have are these free nerve endings. That's these guys here. And so when you damage the skin, it releases chemicals, it activates those fibers, and then it sends a message um, into your spinal cord. These are a picture of the different fibers that are coming from your skin and running into your spinal cord. And there's two things to pay attention when you look at that, those pictures. Is that there's um, different size neurons, or, or these fibers come in different sizes. You have very thin fibers, and you have very big fibers. The bigger the fiber, the faster the message. So these guys are the fastest ones up here. The second thing you'll notice is that some of them have insulation on them, and others don't. Insulation also increases the speed of the message. So some of the messages coming from your skin are really fast, like the sensation of touch, and other messages coming from your skin are quite slow, like the sensation of pain. So pain is carried by these small fibers. Some are myelinated, some are not myelinated. So the pain message is much slower than the other message. And that might not make much sense in terms of pain is such an important stimulus to respond to, why would it be slow? Uh, and we'll get to that in a second. But one of the sensations you'll notice about pain is that when you do something like stub your toe or hit your thumb with a hammer or bump your head on a cabinet, if you pay attention to the sensation, what'll happen is there'll be a quick, immediate pain, and then there'll be a second pain that comes in that's throbbing, and that one will persist. And what's happening in that case is that those myelinated pain fibers are carrying that first initial fast message, and then that delayed, aching, throbbing pain is coming in with these unmyelinated small fibers. So it takes a while for them to send the message, but then they just keep pulsing to cause that pain. So that's the first pain, second pain. I assume most of you have experienced that sensation. If not, next time you slam your finger in the car door, pay attention, and you'll, you'll get both sensations. All right, so now the message has come in, it goes into the spinal cord, and when you get into the spinal cord, here's the message coming in from the hand or the foot, and it comes in, and it talks to a new neuron in the spinal cord. And then the spinal cord is gonna do two things with that message. One, it's gonna send it up to the brain so you can perceive that you have a, pain, and then the second thing it's going to do is send that message to the ventral horn of the spinal cord that's going to send messages out to the muscles so you can move away from it. And so even though the pain message tends to be slower than other input, this reflex piece is actually pretty quick. And um, one of the things that's interesting about that is I, I remember coming home for um, Thanksgiving when I was in college, and like a typical college student, I brought all my laundry, and um, on the morning of Thanksgiving, my mom preheated it oven, and then she went to stick the turkey in, and it wouldn't fit. So she pulled out the, you know, metal rack that's in there, and she set it on top of the washing machine, okay? Just about that time, I came into the laundry room, and I grabbed that metal rack to move it, and instantly dropped it, and then felt the pain. So I actually responded to the stimulus, that is burning my fingers, before I even felt the pain. And that's because this reflex piece here is so quick, it'll actually withdraw you from the stimulus before you have the perception. The message then travels up to the brain, and then you say, ouch, that was stupid. <laughs> I didn't say anything bad about my mom, she's here tonight. Um, <laughs> but once again, you've had experiences like that too, um, and whether you've, acknowledge it or not, if you pay attention when you do things like that, when you burn yourself or have some stimulus like that, you'll notice that you actually um, have a reflex response that's mediated totally by the spinal cord, and then you have the perception. Um, so 
far, we've got the message into the spinal cord. So it's come in from the periphery, it's in the spinal cord, and then this message sends it up to the brain. And no perception of pain happens until that message gets to the cortex. So it has to get to the top part of the brain before you perceive anything. So someone who you know, breaks their spinal cord and is paralyzed, if you stick a needle into their foot, they will have a reflex withdrawal from that because it'll activate these pain fibers and they'll have the reflex. And that message will travel up as far as it can until it hits that lesion and then it'll stop. And so there'll be no perception of pain at all, but the reflex will st still be there. This is the same mechanism by which if you are um, having an epidural you know, during um, childbirth, you know, it's blocking the pain there, and this neuron is still active. It's just not getting up to the brain so that you could perceive the pain. So this is a uh, brain scan of someone uh, when they're applying a painful stimulus to the person, and then just looking at what parts of the brain are activated. And when the pain message gets to the brain, once again, it gets split into two different pathways. One pathway goes to the somatosensory cortex, which is just simply involved in coding what the stimulus is. You know, that was a burn, it was a cut, it was this intense, or it was just a mild burn. It's telling you those kinds of things. And then you have input to a second area called the anterior cingulate cortex, which you see in the middle here, it's on both sides, and that is the suffering part. That's the part that says, ouch, this was bad, it really bothers me. The thing that's interesting about that um, split in sensation is that if you can go in and just remove this part of the brain, you can have a painful stimulus come in and someone will say, yeah, that's a burn, it's a pretty intense burn, but it doesn't bother me. It just doesn't affect you that much because you don't have that anguish part associated with it. Okay? So it separates in different parts of the brain. All right, so that's the neuroanatomy of pain. Um, that's about what a uh, medical student probably gets. Now they probably get a little bit more, but not a lot on terms of pain. Um, but now we'll talk about uh, the good part of pain. And so when you look at these images here, the question becomes, are these pains useful or not? And I think you would agree that in most cases, these are useful. You know, th this situation here is obviously a dangerous situation. I mean, it makes me cringe just to see that. But that's one of those things where this kid is gonna burn himself and he will never do it again. He will have a respectful fear of things on the stove. Okay? And that's something that we all experience. We learn from those experiences. You know, same thing with the bee. You get stung by a bee, and you know, some people end up with a whole phobia about bees. You know, even a fly that looks like a bee, they freak out. Okay? So you learn from these things. Um, this, is this a, a useful pain? Well, if you think about it in the context of you know, a boy who's skateboarding and he falls and skins his knee, if you take away that pain piece, what's that kid gonna do? He's gonna hop back up and just keep going and fall again and fall again until his skin is completely gone, okay? So the pain actually slows him down, makes him think about what he's doing. And then perhaps the most important pain of all is this one, you know? You have a soccer player running down the field, somebody gets a little bit too close to him, he falls over in agony, moaning and groaning, and um, it's really useful because then the referee calls a foul. <laughs> and, um, and the nice thing about this pain is it's really easy to treat. You know, all you gotta do is give the guy a yellow card, give him a penalty kick, and the guy pops up instantly and kicks the ball, okay? Um, so some are easy to deal with, others, others less so. This is what happens when you don't have pain sensation. So um, this is a, a very rare condition called congenital insensitivity to pain, and this boy um, does not feel pain. And what you can notice is that he's missing fingers on both hands. Uh, he has open wounds on his knees. He's using a walker, which is pretty strange for a kid of about 12. And um, part of what's going on is that your hips and your knee joints, you will just completely destroy those if you don't have pain sensation. And this is something that you're not even conscious of. If you're sitting on the ground or even in a chair and, you, and you're uncomfortable, your body will naturally adjust to reduce that pain. If you don't get those pain sensations, you will wrench your knee, you will wrench your hip until um, those joints don't work. And so that's what's happened to him. Um, you know, I use this image. There are other images of people with this condition, which I didn't even want to show you because, you know, if you don't have sensation in the mouth and, you know, you see this with kids when they get anesthetic um, for dental work, is they'll chew holes in their lip or, you know, chew on their tongue. It's, it's pretty um, sad. My guess is that he's missing teeth also, but, um, 
But the other thing, you know, is he doesn't feel pain. So he, you know, he's not upset by this whole situation. This is just kind of the way he lives in the world. Someone with this condition will not live typically beyond the age of 20. And so that's why when I say that pain is probably the most important sensory system you have, you know, if you're blind or deaf or can't smell, you're still gonna live a full life. But if you have this condition, you will not. Okay. Um, the other um, deficit that people with this condition often have is they don't um, regulate temperature. And so a lot of times if it's the pain condition that doesn't kill them, it'll be the um, overheating that will. So I think that picture alone tells you the value of pain more than anything. Um, the other thing that um, is good about pain is that your body has natural mechanisms to control it. So, you know, enkephalin and beta endorphin, these are naturally occurring opiates that your brain makes and releases when it needs to. Um, and so, uh, the, there's, there's these opioids are in a number of places in the brain, but the best characterized system is a system that starts in a structure called the periaqueductal gray. It's actually in the midbrain here, and then it sends messages down to the spinal cord. And what it does then is when a pain message is coming in from the foot and entering the spinal cord, it can turn those neurons off. So you have the power in your head to turn those neurons off and block pain. So um, this is uh, Sir David Livingston. Um, well, this is Sir David Livingston here, but uh, <laughs> he was a missionary and uh, he you know, traveled in Africa. And uh, this is a situation where uh, he was attacked by a lion. Um, I was going to read that to you, but um, I can just tell you the story instead. And uh, he described—he actually survived this attack. And he describes the attack as um, a little bit like being on chloroform, where the animal grabs him. He knows that it has him. It shakes him like a terrier shakes a rat. He says, and we—you know—we've seen animals do that. That's how he got shook here. He says he turned around and looked at the beast knowing full well what was going on, but feeling no pain at all. And then he attributes this to the benevolence of God, to let people die without pain. That's how he ends that essay. Okay? As a scientist, I attribute that to these endogenous opioids I just mentioned. Is that when you're in a situation where it's life or death, what you do is you shut that pain off and try to survive. So the story I told at the beginning, where I was in the wave tumbling, I knew what my priority was, was to get out of the water. Survival was the first thing I needed to do. I did not feel much pain at that point. It wasn't until I got up on the beach that the pain kicked in. And I can guarantee you that he, uh, Livingston, can say he felt no pain while it shook him. After it put him down, and he went back to his tent, he had plenty of pain. Okay, so those opioids will come in and allow you to escape from a dangerous situation. You know, if you have to run, you will run. If you have to run through berry bushes, you will run through them. You will pay for it later, but you will live. And that's what those opioids are really doing. In terms of pain, there's really two things. People talk about the stimulus, but one of the things that is very clear about pain is that the stimulus can vary quite a bit from quite mild to quite extreme, and people's perception of it can be quite different. So, you know, he went and voluntarily went to get a tattoo, and I mean, I know it hurts, but come on. <laughs> you know, this is a bit much. Um, there's also a psychological component to it in terms of how much pain you feel. Um, you know, and in, in contrast, a situation like this, where if you were to put me even just walking on dirt like that, a gravel road like that, it would be painful for me. I mean, part of it is, you know, her feet are used to it, but it's also a mindset where this is normal for her um, running in, on this kind of ground. And so that pain has two pieces. It's the sensory input and then the psychological component. You know, people joke that, um, you know, paper cut, cuts the worst kind. And it, sometimes it is. It really does hurt that much. All right. So that was all the good stuff. <laughs> now we go bad. Um, the... Acute pain stuff is all the stuff I was talking about before. So it's this piece here um, where that pain is designed specifically to protect you. It keeps you from damaging your body. It allows you to survive. Um, it's closely linked to inducing memories. You know, once again, that, that um, memory of me in the water, I remember the details of that 15 years later. Um, everything on this side here uh, is chronic pain. And there's really no purpose for that. The only thing linked to that is suffering. And that 
if that pain's there, it's not warning you to do something. And in most cases, um, avoiding doing something isn't gonna make you safer. It doesn't protect you in any way. And so this is a huge problem, and I just underlined a few of these different conditions. You know, arthritis, a huge problem. Migraine, a huge problem. Um, I just underlined diabetic neuropathy, but there's many different types of neuropathy. Um, and uh, inflammatory bowel, lower back pain, you know, probably the most common type of pain. Um, and then fibromyalgia. So there's all sorts of these types of pain that people have that really serve no purpose other than the suffering piece. So, you know, when you think about these pains, I, I'm kind of curious, how many people in the audience actually know someone who has chronic pain? And chronic pain is defined as pain that persists for three months. And it doesn't have to be every day for three months. It can be, you know, on and off, like migraine. So let me see those hands again. How many people? Wow, okay, that's good. Um, <laughs> yeah. How many people actually have chronic pain that they, uh, okay. Yeah, that's about right. Um, because in terms of the cost of pain, 100 million people, this is almost 30% of the population, have a chronic pain problem. And you know, that includes all of those different types of pains I mentioned. Um, so the cost in terms of suffering you know, is immense. The cost in terms of the financial cost, both in terms of uh, health care, necessary to treat people, and lost productivity from people in pain, is huge. In fact, that cost is greater than the combined cost of heart disease and cancer together. So that's a huge issue. Problem number two with chronic pain is what's causing it. And you know, this, this seems like it should be pretty straightforward, but it's not. It's a really complicated problem. So if you think about something like migraine, you know, here's a, just an image here. And one of the issues with migraine is we, we know the brain is involved because there's aura that's often associated with migraine. Uh, we know the vascular system is involved because most of the treatments that treat migraine deal with, you know, changing the vascular system. Um, and then the, um, there's a fiber covering, covering of the brain called the meninges, and it has um, fibers that come from it, and they carry the pain messages you know, back into the brain. That's involved too. So there seems to be something going on with all three of those, but if you ask scientists what's going on, they've been studying this for a long time, and they cannot agree whether it's the brain, the vascular, or the um, fibers carrying those messages. Um, neuropathic pain is a, a very difficult condition. So neuropathic pain refers to those conditions where there's some sort of damage to the neurons um, in the periphery. And what'll happen is someone will get a cut or something um, and it'll damage that fiber that's going up to the spinal cord. And then the injury will heal and yet the pain will persist. And it'll persist to the point where in some cases just blowing air on the skin or gently brushing it can evoke e intense pain. All right, so these are very difficult conditions. Um, neuropathic pain, like I mentioned, there's diabetic neuropathy. Um, there's actually chemotherapy-induced uh, neuropathies. There are many different types of neuropathy, but it is a very difficult condition. What causes it? There are lots of um, hypotheses, very little uh, clear evidence. So some people think it's these glial cells that are too active in the spinal cord. Um, in other cases, there doesn't seem to be anything wrong with the neuron or with the spinal cord, it seems to be something else is going on somewhere else. Fibromyalgia, 20 years ago, people didn't even recognize that as a pain condition. You, know, you can see there's a lot of um, work to be done in terms of what's causing these things. And part of the problem, you know, as I mentioned at the very beginning when I was talking about the neuroanatomy and the, the fact that neurons, if they're active, they're carrying a pain message, it doesn't matter which neuron in this pathway is active. If it's active, you're feeling pain. So when someone says, oh, it's just in your head, yeah, that doesn't discount the pain, that just means that those neurons in your head are active, and that pain sensation is every bit as real as if I was, you know, Dr. Liston cutting off your leg. Um, so when you look at the um, input from the spinal cord, you know, this message travels up, and uh, if these spinal neurons are active, even though whatever's happened in the periphery has healed, you're still feeling pain. Um, if this neuron up in the cortex is active, then you're feeling pain also. So that's what makes uh, these pains difficult to treat, is you don't know which neurons are active. Um, you know, this situation here is a little bit like, you know, when you flip the switch, a light switch on, 
you know, what it does is it sends electric current up the wire into the light and it turns the light on. So if you were thinking about it as a pain stimulus, yeah, you get that, the light goes on, you feel pain. But in neuropathic pain or in some of these other pain conditions, what happens is the light switch is off. There's nothing coming in from the periphery and yet the light is on. That's how abnormal it is. Okay, and that's why it's so hard to treat. You know, I mentioned fibromyalgia. You know, you can also have um, problems with this descending pathway I mentioned before, where um, when you get a fever, how do you feel? Well, you get achy, your whole body aches. And what appears to be going on is that this descending system that modulates pain, it can make pain worse or less intense. And so when you're, when you're in a fever, it actually shuts off and um, enhances the sensation of pain. That keeps you from moving around too much so you can uh, recover. But it also could be a mechanism for fibromyalgia. You know, if the system is just naturally less quiet, then you would feel that same achy feeling all the time. So there's, there's things that people are looking at. If that's actually the cause, that's, that's kind of where scientists are trying to figure things out. And then problem number three is inadequate treatments for pain. If we look at this slide, this is just a listing of the different pain medications that are available. Each one of these is copyrighted by you know, some company who's made them. Um, and you know, the goal is not to read all those because it's, it's impossible. But guess what? This is only the first page. There's a whole other page of them. Okay? There's over 400 medications out there to treat pain. And why do you have that many? Because they don't work that well. Okay? If you had one that worked really well, then you wouldn't need 400. Alternative treatments are not much better. So um, this is a non-scientific survey of people who are on this pain website, but they're just listing what they would do for pain. And so on this side here, it's just saying, you know, what treatments have you tried? And people have tried lots of things. You know, they try praying. Um, they try hypnosis. They try all sorts of things. And if you have a chronic pain condition, you're willing to try anything. You know, because it really is an intense pain that just doesn't go away. But what's interesting is when you look at this side here, this is was it effective or not? And you know, there's only two things that are over 50 that worked in 50% of the people. You know, massage was better than 50%, and medical marijuana was up at 80%. You know, not that many people tried it, but for the ones who did, it was pretty effective. Um, so you can thank Nixon for this one again. Actually, it's not, it's not Nixon's fault anymore because Congress had the opportunity to take it off a Schedule I uh, listing last summer and they wouldn't do it, okay? It's a scary drug, you know? I don't know why, but it is. Um, but, you know, what's interesting about this also is that, you know, some of these things, they say, oh, well, it works in 30, you know, a third of the people that take it. If I gave you a placebo, just a sugar pill that does absolutely nothing, and said, here, take this, this will make your pain better, that works in 40% of the people. So placebo is as good as all these things, except for the medical marijuana and the massage. The two most common treatments for pain are um, things that you know of. You know, the NSAIDs are non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, and these are things that you can buy at any pharmacy. Um, you don't need a prescription, and you can pick those things up. Um, opioids, um, are, you know, this is the list of the most common opioids used, but these are drugs that you do need a prescription for. And if you look at the difference between the NSAIDs and the opioids, um, you know, once again, we have this pathway of pain from the knee into the spinal cord and up to the brain. And what NSAIDs are doing is they're really dealing with the inflammation part of it. So they're good at dampening down pain, taking away inflammation, but they're not really great is that if you took you know, as much aspirin as you wanted, you know, if I still took a knife and ran it across your hand, it would hurt, okay? I would still activate those fibers. But that's not the case with opioids. You know, if I give you a, a good enough dose with opioids, and I, sh I should say not everyone responds to opioids in the same way, but for uh, most people, I give you opioids, they're working in the periphery, they're working in the spinal cord, they're working in the periaqueductal gray, and they're shutting off pain in multiple places. And in that case, you can cut someone with a knife. They don't like it because they can still feel the touch part of it. It's very uncomfortable to feel someone cutting through your skin. But the pain part is dampened. It's shut down. Okay. So opioids are very powerful compared to these uh, NSAIDs. The problem with opioids are many. 
One is you get tolerance to opioids. So this is just fake data. I figured that was a really popular thing this day to do fake things, so I brought you some fake data. Um, <laughs> but what I did is uh, just plotted what tolerance would look like. So the first time you take an opiate, you know, it works really well. The second time you take it, it doesn't work as well, or the third time. And then, you know, after a while, it just stops working. And so what you need to do is you have to increase the dose to block the pain. So that's the effect of tolerance. So opioids are very sensitive to tolerance. Um, you know, the side effects, there's a whole list of them. And these aren't side effects that affect everybody. Different people are affected in different ways. You know, opioids make me feel itchy, and so that's really bothersome. But um, for other people, it has other effects. But there's lots of side effects. And then the other big problem with opioids is this dependence issue, is if you take them repeatedly, you can become dependent on them. So we're gonna talk a little bit about that. This is the place where the story gets ugly. So in terms of overdose deaths, in uh, 1914, um, there were over 30,000 Americans died of opioid overdose. Um, if you look at the top 10 list of drugs that will kill you, six of the 10, the ones that are underlined in red, are opioids. So these drugs are lethal. And the way they kill you typically is to make you stop breathing. So they depress respiration. Um, you know, so you can look at stats like 30,000 Americans, or you can also look at you know, what happened to Prince last summer. He was taking an opioid fentanyl, and uh, that's what killed him. And you know, fentanyl on this list is down here. Um, the new fentanyl that's coming into the country now is much more potent. It's much higher okay, in terms of uh, what people are dying from now. Fentanyl is one of these opioids that has a very fast onset, and, uh, and so it's extremely dangerous for that reason also. So this graph is showing you that if you, if you look at opioid use over the past uh, 20 years or so, um, the amount of opioids that have been sold, and you know, this is just the increase in prescriptions, um, it's increased drastically over that 20 year period. And you know, people are kind of shocked about, well, why are they giving so many opioids? But if you go prior to 1990s, opioids were underprescribed. In fact, people would suffer um, from chronic pain conditions and, and physicians were hesitant to give them opioids at all. And so then the question becomes, well, do I treat people or not? And so you can give them opioids and treat them, but as the number, as the number of prescriptions increases, the number of people who are dependent and the number of people who die also increases. Now, I'm not trying to scare you away from using opioids, because depending on which papers you read, only five to 30% of people who take opioids for a pain problem are gonna become dependent on them, okay? And I can ask you right now, you know, how many of you are dependent on coffee? I mean, how many of you drink coffee every single day? Okay. And what happens if you don't drink coffee for a day? You get a headache. And how do you treat that headache? You go back and take your drug. Okay. Um, so this is the situation you know, with opioids, too, is some people become dependent on it in that same way. And you know, the problem with opioids is that the symptoms are a lot worse than a headache. And so when someone's taking an opioid, um, they typically cause these effects. You know, you, opioids have you, give a euphoric feeling. Um, they're analgesic, they block pain. Uh, they cause constipation, which isn't actually a pleasable, pleasant thing. People complain a lot about that who are on chronic opioids. Um, and they have a sedative effect. But when you stop taking, the nervous system doesn't just go back to normal. What it does is it swings in the other direction and you have people then who have dysphoria. They just don't feel good. Um, aches and pains all over the body, uh, nausea and diarrhea, um, and then insomnia. So you can't even go to sleep to escape this. You know, you're awake and this is kind of suffering. So if you were one of those patients that had these symptoms, what would you do? Go back and take the drug, okay? Because that's what you need to do. And that's where dependence addiction comes in. So the treatment, that is used is usually just to transfer people from one opioid to another opioid. And the opioid that get tra you get transferred to are these long-lasting opioids like buprenorphine, which is the main ingredient in Suboxone, or methadone. So you've heard of methadone maintenance clinics. What people do in these clinics is they go in and they get their methadone and they drink it once a day. The half-life of methadone, that is how long it takes to clear your body, is 35 hours. So instead of going up and down on heroin or fentanyl, it just keeps you maintained like this. Okay? So you're not really taking away the dependence. What you're doing is you're maintaining people on an opioid so they can function. If you take away methadone maintenance clinics, 
then people are going to seek the drug in other ways. Okay, so this, there has been con controversy in the past about whether these clinics should be in your community or not, and they are in this community. Um, but you know, in terms of maintaining people, you'd rather have people going here than going in and uh, finding the drugs in other ways and having to pay for it. All right, so now I'm going to try to give you a little bit of hope, but it's, it's really just going to be a little bit. Um, the future is bright, but right now we have a lot of work to do. So, you know, the goal of basic science is to translate things from the animal situation so that we can treat this condition here. You know, we want to deal with the pain thing. Research requires that you do the testing here first than there. And I know that some people don't like animal research. Um, the thing is, is there's requirements. You can't just bring a drug to market that has not been tested. It's mandatory. But there are lots of problems. And so these are all drugs here or drug classes that have been used in animal studies and shown to produce analgesic effects. They block pain. And then when they were brought to clinical trials, none of them worked. And it wasn't that they didn't block pain in humans. Some of them did, but they caused such severe side effects that they couldn't be used. And this, this figure down here um, is actually information that I got at a Science on Tap talk that I went to last year about just drug development. And one of the issues with drug development is that you know, these, these drug companies, these basic scientists, will have to test 10,000 drugs just to get down to one drug that works. There's a huge investment of, of you know, screening drugs. And all this research starts with animals before you can get way up here to test with humans. So this, says, this figure is you know, up to eight years. Uh, the person that gave the talk last year to Science on Tap she said that was eight to 14 years is really what the drug development time is. And so you know, part of the reason these drug companies are charging you so much for drugs is that you know, their hit rate is only one out of 10,000 and they're trying to recoup all the other costs. You know, plus those CEOs are making so much money, it's disgusting, but that's another issue. Um, all right, so part of the problem with animal research that has happened in the past is that it doesn't match well with what's going on with pain patients. And so if you're gonna to try to do translation, you need to have translation that is comparable. And so um, you know, with animal research, the, the typical goal is to look at complete inhibition of pain. Can we shut pain down completely? And then we use tests where we apply a stimulus. This is the hot plate test that you're looking at there, where you just put a rat on a plate that's warm. It's like standing on hot sand. And then after about 10 seconds, the rat will lick its foot. He's essentially saying, hey, this is warm. And if you give it an opiate or some other pain medication, it'll stand on that plate even longer. You know, it'll stand there for 50 seconds or so. That is not the type of pain that is bothering people. And in fact, I would argue that's not the type of pain we want to treat. Because as I showed you very early on in this talk, is that if you block all sensation of pain, you're going to destroy your body. What you want to do is leave normal pain intact and get rid of the abnormal pain. That's the real goal. And you know, a physician will tell you, I can't treat your pain. What I can do is get you back functioning. Or I don't even know if they'll tell you they can do that, but that's their goal, is to get you back functioning. And so you know, this is the goal, deal with the abnormal pain, and then get back to normal function. So something has to change with the animal research. And um, if you want to have an effective treatment, there's two things you need to think about. One, the drug has to produce analgesic effects. It has to dampen the pain. The second thing is that the side effects have to be minimal. If you have disruptive side effects, then people aren't going to take the drug. And some people won't take opioids for that very reason, just because the side effects for them are so severe they don't want to take the drug. They'd rather have the pain problem. All right. And this is the problem with translation that I mentioned earlier, is that you have these drugs that, that are analgesic in animals, but they don't translate because of all the problems associated with them. So what we've been doing in my lab is trying to find a different way where we're actually looking at function. But what happens is that animals just naturally, or rats and mice will just naturally run on wheels. And so what it does is it gives you a baseline for what their normal activity levels are. And then what you can do is you can introduce a pain problem and they do the exact same thing that people do, is that they don't get on the wheel. You know, if you have a pain problem, you're not gonna go out and, and run. Sometimes you might not even go out and socialize or go to work. What you'll do is you'll stay at home in bed or on the sofa. And so what we're trying to do is model that same kind of situation here. What's interesting about this approach is that if you have a drug that has severe side effects, yeah, I can reduce the pain in this rat, but he won't get up and run. 
And this is some of the data that we've collected um, just showing uh, running levels. There's two things noteworthy about this, is that um, this is a 24-hour period, 12 hours at night, 12 hours a day, and what you can see is that these lines here just show how much running these rats are doing. And at night is when rats do their running. They're, they don't run during the day, so it's on a flip cycle from what you do. You know, the daytime when the lights are on, that's when rats are sleeping. When you go to bed, that's when they come out and they're checking out your kitchen. Okay? Um, the other thing you'll notice when you look at this picture is that the female rats run so much more than the male rats. Okay? In fact, we had a female rat in this group here that ran eight miles every night. I mean, it's literally running into Portland, checking out new seasons, and coming back. <laughs> so, so they run a lot. So what happens then is if you introduce a pain problem, and so in these rats, what we did is we just gave them a little inflammation in the hind paw, and the rats did the exact same thing that you would have. If you had an inflamed toenail or infl inflammation of the foot, you would become less active. And so what you see along here is just the days, and this is their baseline level of running. Is that 100%? We just defined that. Um, and then you give the pain problem here, and they stop running. For two days, they don't run. And then slowly what they do is they start using the paw. And if you were to look at them, what you would notice is that they run favoring that paw the same way you start walking again. You start limping along, and then with time, they get better and better and better until they're right back to normal. Okay? So what we want to do then is give a pain treatment and say, oh, can we bring this back up here? And if you just look at opiates, once again, opiates are the best painkillers we have right now, morphine uh, being the prototypical opiate. Um, what you can do is if you get the dose right, that's these middle doses here, it actually brings them back up to running. So this is now hour by hour instead of day by day, just because the uh, effect of morphine only lasts about 90 minutes. Um, but what you can see is it brings them back up to baseline, and then when the drug wears off, they'll drop back down, although not that group, but the females, they come up and they go back down. What's interesting about these data, too, is that when you get the dose of morphine too high, that is this 3.2 milligram per kilogram, this is the dose that almost every scientist across the country uses when they're looking at pain evoke tests. And guess what happens when we use that drug in our hands? It suppresses activity completely. This is not the kind of dose you would want to give to people. It just sedates them so they don't do anything. You want to restore function. So we think that this test is a good way to get back at um, you know, dealing with pain in the way that pain affects people. And so I'm hoping that this will change the way the pain field works and start screening drugs using this approach instead of the way it's been. The goal is to restore function, get them back to this, and that's what we're trying to do. So, you know, with research, you know, what we're trying to do is, uh, one, gain knowledge about pain. And I said we don't know, you know, know what's going on with these different pain conditions. We've learned a lot about pain. In fact, scientists know a ton about how things are processed and what um, chemicals are involved, what proteins and receptors and things like that. Um, you know, what we're starting on, working on now is these new models, animal models of pain, so we can mimic the human condition better. And then my hope is that that'll lead to better treatment so that instead of dealing with this, you can have that situation. And, you know, in these situations, I'm not saying that we can restore to get rid of the pain. What we're really trying to do is just restore function. You know, dampen the pain down enough so that people can function. That's the main goal. The problem is that right now there aren't drugs to do that. And so you're not left with a lot of options. Um, but, you know, the typical things that people talk about with regards to any health issue apply to pain too. In fact, I just came back from um, the American Pain Society meeting. Yes, we have a meeting every year uh, about pain. Um, and one of the major themes that came out of that meeting was this idea of just breaking the cycle of pain. And one of the problems that happens with pain is that pain is, is so intrusive that it'll disrupt your sleep. And if you don't sleep well, then your pain is worse. And if your pain's worse, then you don't sleep. And so you just end up in this cycle of pain and um, inability. So, you know, part of the issue is trying to break that cycle and get you to actually have a good night's sleep and try to break through that. You know, but also having a network of friends, exercise, eating well, having hobbies, all of those things are helpful. And, you know, I know for people who are in pain, it's like the pain is too bad to do those things. That's the problem right now, is that you can't really block out all the pain. What you need to do is try to function. At least that's the main goal, is to get people functioning again. And that will allow people, that will dampen the pain a little bit. You know, just to recap, 
um, you know, I try to talk about the good part of pain, that it is a very important sensation. That's why it plays such a vital role in life. Um, but when it goes bad, it goes really bad. And, you know, the treatments for pain um, are limited, and then opioid dependence has become a huge problem. It's, you know, it's referred to as the opioid epidemic. And once again, most people do not become dependent when they take opioids, but a certain percentage will. Um, and then, you know, I labeled the talk, or I kind of used the title of this movie in the title of my talk, and, you know, most Hollywood movies end happily ever after, and, you know, in The Good, The Bad, and The Ugly, if you're Clint Eastwood, it ends pretty good. You walk off with all the money. Um, my hope is that with the pain situation, we'll also have a happily ever after story, and that if we can develop better treatments, and I do believe that there will be better treatments coming, um, they're not here now, but there is a lot of work um, on this topic, and, um, and there is hope. So with time, there will become better treatment. And a lot of that treatment is going to become very personalized. You know, people vary so much that that's kind of the way the treatments are probably going to go. So I did want to thank, you know, the research part that I presented. That's been funded by the National Institutes of Health, in particular the um, Institute of Neurological Disorders and Stroke. Um, you know, Washington State um, Initiative 502, every time you buy an, a beer upstairs, some of the tax that you pay goes to the state of Washington, and then that gets fed back into um, research labs so we can actually study alcohol and drug abuse issues. So Washington State University gets some of that money, University of Washington gets some of that money to actually do research into these issues. Um, they had an initiative like this for the marijuana too, and the first year, you know, they made so much money, and uh, the legislature, you know, had given some of that back. The second year, they wanted to keep it all. So right now, we're fighting with the legislature trying to get some of that money uh, to keep coming to research so we can actually study some of the effects of marijuana. So, and, and there's been a real lack of research in marijuana just because it is a scheduled one drug. It's really hard to get um, to do research. Um, just a little aside, as we do a little bit of research with marijuana, and I mean a very little amount of marijuana. The amount of marijuana we use in these rats is like 50 milligrams. I mean, I literally I could hold it on the top of my thumb. I had to spend $400 getting a state license to do that. I had to buy a $300 safe that is locked in my lab, and yet I can walk three blocks from my house and buy a ton of this stuff and <laughs> spread it all over my yard, okay? Um, so, you know, that's the federal government versus the state, you know, there's all sorts of issues here. Um, most of the research stuff that I presented is done by my graduate student who just got his PhD last month, Ram uh, Kandasamy. And then there's been all sorts of um, undergraduates who's, who's helped out in the lab too on these studies, so working on some of this uh, stuff. Yeah. With that, I think we will say thank you to uh, Dr. Mike Morgan. Thank you. Um, thank you all for coming, and have a great evening. Thanks for coming. Thank you for listening. This podcast and Science on Tap are created by VIA Productions. And we're based in Portland, Oregon in the U.S. We have lots of events coming up on topics ranging from geology to bees. So if you want to find out more about how to come to an event in person, check out our website at scienceontaporwa.org. And that last part stands for Oregon and Washington. You can also find us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at scienceontaporwa. As always, a huge thank you to the volunteers who have helped me run these events for years. They are Scott Fry, Chris Gowan, Sam Lauk, Rita Nigren, and Steve Perry, as well as many others, and these events would not happen without them. I'd also like to say a special thanks to Amber Peoples for managing the show for the past several months. Finally, thank you to Jonathan Colton for letting us use his song Mandelbrot Set as our theme music. One just